Butler from our NMA family from previous Q and A's. Um, Arvind Kumar, who you also already know, and if you were up earlier, he was part of the other uh, Q and A in this section. And of course, Conrad Curtin needs no introductions. You guys are all too familiar with him by this point. So like uh, all of these Q and A's, let's start with the reflections. Um, this is really important for us to get your feedback about today's content for next year. So we're just gonna kind of sit here quietly and give you a minute or two to um, submit these reflections and then we'll continue with the rest of the session. Great, and I see we're also live streaming on YouTube. That's great. Thanks, Conrad. And note that there's two links, one for interactive students and one for observer students. Great, and I just want to emphasize how important this is to us. We've been getting great feedback every day and we've already been optimizing things based on that feedback. So I really want all of you to do it. Plus, you can win the leaderboard still. So, or at least shoot up on the leaderboard. And humans read them every day, right? Real people take time to read through them. Also, of course, once you're finished, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box. Ah, we already have some coming, that's great. And just a reminder, again, uh, participate in the chat freely. It's nice to see everybody saying hello from all different parts of the world. Uh, but just remember to set your default chat setting uh, to all panelists and attendees so we can all see it. Okay, I think that should be enough time. Yeah, this never gets old. I love seeing the chat thread with people saying where in the world they're from. That's really great. Hello, hello. Okay, great. So why don't we go around the table, the virtual table, and I'd love everyone starting with Juliana, um, and then Juliana can tag the next person to just tell us briefly about your research. And if you could also give us a specific case example of how you use today's tools for uh, a question in your own research. Great, thanks Medina. So, hi guys, you know me already from today's tutorials. I'm Juliana, a research group leader in Frankfurt at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research. Um, I'm generally interested in uh, the emergence of non-random structures and computation in neural circuits and a particular application of the types of topics you learned about today in my work is to understand how neural circuits um, get organized and structured in very early circuit development. So one application besides studying neural circuit dynamics and how these excitatory and inhibitory populations evolve in time is also to study weight dynamics. So just like you learned in the tutorials today, besides writing down differential equations for the um, populations of excitatory and inhibitory neurons, you can write also very similar looking differential equations for how the synaptic weights in these networks evolve in time. So you can have a dynamical system um, for these synaptic weights and you can study it with exactly the same concepts of fixed points, null clines, um, stability of the fixed points, um, and so on. And so in my case, I'm interested in how these activities, uh, you know, what, what they're like in, in very early postnatal development. And uh, then I define what are known as plasticity or learning rules uh, that tell us how these synaptic weights change as a function of these uh, excitatory and inhibitory um, activities. And so, yeah, the application of the dynamical systems approach you learned about today is to now, rather than on the activities, to apply these, uh, these systems on the weights and, and study them uh, using exactly the same approaches. So we want to understand then how these weights get organized 
in, in non-random ways to give rise to, you know, things like receptive fields or recurrently connected networks with non-random structure, things like that. So I will ping the next person, Stefan. You're muted. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Stefan Rotha. I'm here a professor at Freiburg University, Freiburg, Germany, which is the wild southwest of Germany, in fact. I'm here at the Bernstein Center Freiburg, and my research is mainly centered on the activity dynamics of large networks. This is what I'm interested in. So um, I typically consider um, all sorts of neuron models in order to find out what would be common uh, to all of them. And I am now picking for my introduction um, actually some older work where we used so-called stochastic point processes to describe the spiking of nerve cells directly in terms of mathematical equations. So what we actually need is a point process that allows us to describe networks and interactions between neurons in networks. And in this particular study, I, I want to describe now, we were particularly interested in understanding how correlations emerge through complicated interactions in a recurrent network. And it turned out what you can do is actually describe this dynamics on a graph, describe the graph in terms of the adjacency matrix. That is a simple matrix which contains a one if there is a synapse and a zero if there is no synapse. And then by analyzing powers of this adjacency matrix essentially allowed us in terms of algebra to understand what are the second order dynamical properties of the recurrent system. So I think this is very typical uh, of my work. I'm trying to combine stochastic processes with algebraic methods, and in this way, derive interesting properties uh, of network and network dynamics. I'm happy to explain more upon request, of course. Thank you. Uh, who is next? John. So uh, I'm a lecturer in Technological University of Dublin. A uh, math lecturer, but my main research would be behavioral, electrophysiological, and neuroscience. Now, how these kind of rate models would impact my work is uh, the work by Wang and colleagues, uh, which has been looking at decision making processes and um, simulating recordings in LIP to see how information is accumulated. That model heavily influenced a lot of the work I do in EEG, even though EEG isn't the same thing as single cells. A lot of the stuff we see on the scalp looks very similar to what people have shown uh, neuron by neuron and area by area. Um, so that's one way. And on the EEG side, there are two dynamical systems that you wouldn't have come across. Uh, it's called, some people would call it dynamic causal modeling. Other people would just call it, uh, what you call it? Uh, neural mass model. There are differential equations to describe EEG. Um, because what you saw today is um, you can create oscillations, uh, and that's pretty much all EEG is. So, on a bigger level, um, or different kinds of oscillations. And then, as I said last time, if uh, you were here, my very first version of myself, my PhD version of myself, was looking at dynamical systems to look at fluid flow, yeah. all dynamical systems. And then I'll pass on to uh, Arvind Kumar. Yeah, so I guess you recognize me from yesterday and if you were earlier this morning in the other session. Uh, I can just say something that how I try to use the tools that you learned today. So I'm using basically these ideas of dynamical systems to understand brain diseases, to build mathematical models of diseases. For instance, Parkinson's disease is something that uh, uh, you can easily describe using the same kind of math you learned today. Great. And obviously more questions will come up, so we will explore more into that. Great, and Arvind, you were um, very much involved with content creation today and yesterday. So I'll ask you also now to briefly link to the two days. What, what is a common theme between yesterday and today? 
Right. So first of all, you can blame me if you did not like the contents or if you found it too hard or too difficult. And we can also praise Juliana and, and she can share the blame. <laughs> I think Juliana and Richard, these were the two guys who basically, um, I told them something and then they made something nice out of that. So I think they both deserve a lot of credit for that. And there's some compliments in the chat as well. That's nice to see. Thanks. Thanks for the support. So the how do they connect? Um, when we have very limited time for uh, uh, looking into neural hardware, as I like to call it, uh, neurons and synapses and neural networks. So in this limited time, what we could have done. So we chose some very basic properties of neurons. Uh, you started with very simplified neuron model, like a leaky integrate fire neuron, and you looked into how you can vary the spike behavior of this neuron by giving it different statistics, Gaussian white noise or spike trains and things like that. You also saw something about synapses, that there are two types of synapses, excitatory inhibitory, and they are not fixed. They can change either based on their immediate history or because of plasticity rules, for instance, SCD. Now, obviously, brain is not neurons. It's a connected uh, uh, neurons that make the, the brain. It's a network, or maybe network of networks. Perhaps Stefan will agree with me, with me on that. Uh, we can't do everything, but what we could take is that from this low-level description of neurons at the level of uh, uh, their firing behavior and synapses, we can take some properties, put them together, and construct one of the simplest forms of networks. That is the rate model. So what we did is that we borrowed the idea of uh, firing rate curve. You yesterday created that input output firing rate relationship. We took that. We took the idea that there are weights, but we just use those as numbers instead of a proper synaptic kernel. Put them together. We remember that they're of two types, excitatory and inhibitory. And it turns out with just this two dimensional description, you have some very interesting properties coming up. And that's what today you looked at. Now, obviously, this should now expand into more complicated models, putting into more uh, details of biology. And hopefully, you learn some of those ideas either in the lecture by Nicola Brunel or in the lecture by Ken, uh, Ken Miller. Thank you, Arvind. So I think this is how these ideas connect. Together, we give you some glimpse of uh, neural hardware. Great. And last but not least, Conrad, who's our content creator for tomorrow as well. Well, for, for me, there's always the big question on how we want to interpret models. You know? like, and that's, that's, I think, where there's a very strong link here between week three, day two, and week three, uh, day three. You know? like in, on causality day, we will ask under which circumstances we can make statements, like if there had been more activity here, we would have more activity here. And, and in a way, what we, what we have here on day two are models of the nature like we have we can replace all neurons that we have in some area by basically the mass activity of the excited turn the inhibitory neurons or maybe only of one neuron type and on day three we we, we kind of ask how could we in, interrogate reality to ask it how good like this idea is and in that sense i think there's a very nice link where where like day three if, if you want provides the methods to look into how we should structure like the ways of thinking about neurons. And I think there's equally the kinds of models that we want to look at in day three in a way bootstraps of the kinds of models these guys have been developing for this one and two. So it's like a beautiful link, I think. Perfect. I'm excited about today and tomorrow. Uh, I'm a postdoc. I'm Medina Sarvastani. It's my pleasure to host you guys. I'm a postdoc in Max Planck Florida Institute. And in my graduate school days, a million years ago now, uh, I used these tools um, very much in the study of uh, sleep state dynamics, which naturally uh, have these long-term and short-term dynamics, uh, as well as to the study of seizures, seizure formation, and epilepsy in general. Uh, OK, but we have a lot of good questions coming in, so let's go directly to that. Um, I'm looking at the list and there's a lot of great questions. Many of them are sort of in the vein of trying to gain some further intuition for the tools that we learned today. So let's, I like the top voted one actually. Uh, Phoebe's asking, can we detect steady state fixed points from observations from the experiments, from experimental data? Or 
do they always have to be calculated and derived like we saw in the tutorials uh, based on a known model of the system? And that's open to anyone who wants to take it or multiple of you. I mean, I can start, but of course, anybody can jump in. So I guess the, the answer is yes and no. So let's first uh, give the, the yes part of the, the answer. So what are the, the steady states that we learned about? The steady states are just the activities of the excitatory and the inhibitory population towards which the system will evolve to after you have applied some stimulus. So you can either apply the stimulus and the stimulus, uh, you can take away the stimulus or you can continuously apply the stimulus. And then whatever you do, you, you fix the stimulus for some time and then and then you wait and you see what the system would settle to. So if you like to think of this of a you know real neural circuit in the brain, uh, let's let's say uh, this links to the no part of the, the answer, but let's say we take a slice of a of a brain and you patch a neuron, uh, you apply with an electrode some kind of a current, and then you can you know, apply a pulse or you apply a step current to the neuron for one second, then you take it away, and then you record the activity of the neuron. You might see some transient behavior that's directly uh, there uh, observed because of the stimulus that you have applied, the current that you've provided to the neuron, but then you see after some time that the neuron settles into a particular firing. So the neuron can go back down to zero if you provided some excitatory current or it can start oscillating, uh, whatnot. So so th basically, this is how you can get the steady state of, of your neuron. Um, now, of course, the neuron is connected with other neurons uh, in the network. And so, you know, at this one time by, by just patching the neuron, you can just get the steady state of this one neuron. Um, I mean, I'm not an experimentalist, but I know from, from what my collaborators do, they can apply all sorts of drugs to, for example, block synaptic inputs incoming into the neuron. So you can, of course, study the neuron as an isolated uh, entity. But in this case, we would be interested in, you know, the activity of this neuron as a readout of what, how the neuron is responding to the input that you have provided in conjunction with all the other synaptic inputs it's receiving to the network. And then I'm, I'm gonna end by just giving a short part of the answer to why this, you know, it might be hard to find the steady states. And that is if you try to assay this activity in a living brain, so in an animal that's, you know, awake and behaving, uh, and this is now possible, uh, this, you know, might be hard because even, even if you as an experimentalist have full control over the stimulus that you're providing to, to that neuron from which you're recording, you have no idea what other inputs this uh, neuron might be receiving from the surrounding network because, as we said, you know, the animal is behaving, it's seeing things, it's hearing things, it might be moving and so on. And so it might be difficult to, to assess these, uh, assess these uh, steady states. So that's that's what I'm going to say. Of course, I kind of gave the perspective of how you would do this from a single neuron. Uh, maybe someone else can kind of comment about how we could do it in a network with more sophisticated techniques where you could do multi electrode array recordings or potentially calcium imaging and you could look at the activity of many neurons at the same time. Thanks. Yeah, Yuri. maybe I can just continue and yeah. somebody else concludes. So in a system which has very many degrees of freedom, the situation is of course potentially very complicated in the sense that there are multiple fixed points coexisting and there are also degrees of freedom that are essentially not just relaxing to the fixed point, but they are providing some ongoing activation, which some people call noise, other people call ongoing activity this activity is definitely reflecting all sorts of brain processes that happen uh, um, without our control. So they are not part of the model in most cases. And so many researchers would actually call them noise. So how would you then account for these different dimensions and different degrees of freedom? How would you how would you come up with a description that is meaningful uh, to data analysis? And I think, uh, well, one possible approach uh, you can do this is you can theoretically think about possibilities of course graining Starting from a theoretical model with many degrees of freedom, you can ask the question, under which conditions is it actually meaningful to extract from this low dimensional um, fixed points, low dimensional activity that actually matches the description that you come up with. 
for example, in a two-dimensional dynamical system with one excitatory and one inhibitory subpopulation. And I can tell you from a recent project that we are doing that this is a very, very interesting, but also very difficult and complicated question. So what is a mathematical precondition that such cool screening makes sense? Yeah, so there are conditions that have to be applied on the connectivity. There are conditions you have to apply to the nonlinear dynamics of individual neurons. In a nutshell, if the dynamics is too nonlinear, uh, then all cool screening efforts will actually be very, very hard to do in, in mathematical terms. So I would say um, most researchers actually approach this from a very pragmatic point of view, because in mathematical terms, this is a complicated problem. But in practice, uh, you would probably classify most of the ongoing dynamics as noise and consider only some bold phenomena that actually pop to your eyes in a recording uh, as low dimensional dynamics and you talk about fixed points uh, along these lines. So now somebody else should continue, I guess. Any follow up remarks or we can move right along to the next question. Great. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I'd yeah. like to just like uh, do a follow up on the intuition here. So um, it, it's 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 a little unclear to me how experimentally it would could even be possible. No, like I can look at the activity of a given neuron, as Juliana said, and I can say it starts with some activity, it goes to some activity, and it hovers there for a little bit. But we can never expect it to stay somewhere. No, like the animal exactly. like has thoughts and is running around and is doing stuff so 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 so, so could could uh, you guys like sketch a little like how we can produce like glue behind between like these theoretical ideas that are undeniably true in like small simu small networks and maybe simulations and kind of like the level of animals that maybe a lot of our students are thinking of well <clears throat> just to go with the example of the decision making on the Wang model, um, it very nicely reproduces the work by Shadlin from the single cell, but it is that thing is different inputs will get you to different steady states. And it's not that it should stay in a steady state. That means your system won't get kicked out of it. That's a waste of time. It should be transitioning. Uh, and um, this is the one thing, and it's kind of to hark back to bit about yesterday as well. I like the integrating fire model, but it's a flawed model because you have to make an assumption about discretization, like a, a discontinuity to represent a spike. I like the rate model, uh, but it does simplify things, but it works on certain temporal scales. So I, I, I can see the argument why, how is this relevant? But if you think of a decision-making process, one area is saying left, one area is saying right, you want them to repulse each other such that you end up with one having the higher state and that feeds up. But you don't want to keep saying left and left every time, so it has to go back down. And that's both internal input will tell it, say you've made your decision, knock it off, but also external input of the stimuli. So that's why it's hard. But if you can even show for a brief period of time, it rests and can maintain. And the question of noise, that's the hardest question of what the hell is noise? Most of the time, I think it's good. And like with a lot of models, what you see is, a lot of the rate models, they don't have noise, so they just add a noise term. So they look, they don't look deterministic because we that's, don't know what it is, but you don't know what it is when you're doing a single cell recording either. And that's why you average away. Um, but yeah. Let's it, come back to the question of noise. Um, it's, yeah, it's a hard one. Uh, I, I think like, as Stefan's saying, like some people call it noise. It's really just background activity that we don't understand. It's actually kind of in line with the next question. I did some work on autism, and there was a hypothesis that I poo poo a bit uh, where people with autism have a noisy brain. And um, that means that you understand what noise is, and that's why it kind of annoys me. Uh, but if you have noise, it means different things to different people. And with a rate model, for example, uh, is noise the accumulation rate. So do you change the tau as a function of the disease or do you change uh, the F function? And all these things are up for discussion because they have very different meanings 
And maybe they have the same output. Maybe in the end, for example, with the reaction time, the decision-making model, the person reacts slower. For example, like Parkinson's. Um, I've done some work where you show people with Parkinson's move are slower reaction time tasks. Is that because they have a movement disorder or is that because they have cognitive delay? And rate models can help distinguish them. I always find this funny. You run, a, <laughs> you run an experiment in someone with a, a movement delay and you get a slower reaction time and that's viewed as a win. It's probably better to show that there isn't a difference and then why there isn't. But, you know, this question of noise is a big question. And for yeah, example, this question of noise, condition. sorry, John. This yeah. question of noise has come up. It's funny. Almost every session, regardless of the content of that it's day, hard. We, it's, we it's always come back to things. this question of what is the definition of noise? Is it the stuff that's not in your model? Is it actual variability? But let's move right along to the next question because I think it ties in well with what you're saying. Also, minus one point for uh, referencing the Shadlin paper, although you later went on to define the study. So I'll take that. Sorry, away. sorry. Yeah. No, 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 I'm just joking. Okay, so there's several people, Elizabeth, Patricia, uh, Akulesh, sorry if I'm butchering those, um, that essentially want to know when it's appropriate to abstract out and use these rate models versus when you need to use the spiking information. Things uh, like plasticity rules or Akulesh is asking if um, these models can be used to study formation of new synapses. When, when is the specific spiking information important and when can you use these rate models? It's always the same question. At what level do you want to study the problem? So the question of rate versus spike based models is really what is the temporal resolution at which you want to study a neural circuit? Let's call it a neural circuit, a neural network. And it's a very similar question to at what level do you want to study it spatially, right? So uh, we talked a little bit, I mean, today, the whole focus of today was coarse graining and, and rather than talking about, so I'm going to switch a little bit to the spatial aspect, rather than talking about the activity of individual neurons, and, you know, I'm sure yesterday you learned all about uh, from Yota Poirazzi how to model, how to give like real justice to the computations that real neurons are performing, right? So you have the cell body of the processes and so on. But everything we did today, we said, okay, forget about these single, these single neurons and the processes. They're very important. But at the moment, we're just going to care about how excited and inhibitory populations of neurons uh, interact or talk to each other. So we made the assumption that we went from the spatial scale of a single neuron where, you know, we have spines and individual synaptic inputs coming in at different portions of the, of the dendritic tree to kind of a coarse grained spatial representation of these interacting populations. And now the spiking versus rate based, it's exactly the same kind of uh, uh, approach or reduction just in the temporal domain. So if we talk about rate based models, right, Conrad's nodding, right? If we talk about rate based models, you know, we're not necessarily doing things wrong or, or right, right? That what kind of level model you work with, both at the spatial and the temporal scale, really depends on the type of question you're answering. So if we're asking and trying to answer. So if, you know, the obviously when you deal with rate based models, you completely lose the precision that single spikes provide, right? So single spikes, this is how neurons communicate. And so this is extremely important if you know that you're studying a brain area where single neurons, you know, where the single individual spikes of single neurons, say these neurons fire very, very sparsely, sparsely at very, very low firing rates. And you know that with certainty that each individual spike carries information. Or maybe these are in fire, fire in bursts, but you know that the first spike in that burst is extremely important to signal some event, like the onset of running or the onset of a left-right decision. So if you decide that, if you know, actually, not decide, if you if you decide uh, uh, that the, the you, you know, the problem that you're studying does not require this kind of precision that the spikes bring, then it's okay to use these uh, these rate based models. And as theorists, you know, we oftentimes use, use these rate based models because it allows us to address these questions kind of at the larger, also at the larger spatial scale. I know there are, these things are a little bit coupled uh, to each other. So rather than studying what individual neurons are doing by course creating the problem and lumping all these neurons into populations, it allows you to say, okay, I don't care necessarily how individual neuron fi fires its uh, precisely time spikes. What I care about is how this 
population of neurons that have presumably a similar uh, property. So I am allowed to lump them as a population, how they modulate their firing rate um, up and down. And, and so, you know, just I'm going to end with an example from my own research. I mentioned I'm interested in postnatal development. And so here we study a lot about uh, we, we study activity that is generated intrinsically in the circuit. So we're thinking about cortex here, for example, completely independent of sensory experience. And the structure of the neurons is at these very early developmental stages is such that they're very sluggish. You know, they haven't developed all the appropriate complement of ion channels that they have when they're adult. They cannot really fire these precise spikes. If they fire spikes, they're very fat and very short, so they don't go up to you know, 20, 30 millivolts. They, they stay fairly hyperpolarized. And so this gives us you know, kind of the, the right, or, or it allows us to make the assumption that we're not going to care about the precise timing of spikes, but we're just going to potentially model or represent their activity just, just as rates. Um, so that's that's what I would say. I really, what what you do depends depends on the answer. And a lot of the time, you know, we use these techniques together. I mean, uh, uh, at the same time. I mean, maybe Stefan can can say a little bit about this. You know, we define what are known as mean field models, where you know, on one hand, we can solve a rate based a system of equations and understand how things behave at this core scale, but then we can complement that with numerical simulations of you know thousands of neurons. Now computers allows us allow us to do this. Thousands of spikes neurons and then kind of see uh, what what the difference uh, potentially might be. All right, so I can continue here. So we have been talking about stationary activity. So this is how the whole discussion started. And stationary activity is linked to this concept of a fixed point, of an attractive fixed point, in fact. But there are other types of fixed points. There are, for example, fixed points that repel activity. So that's something which looks very nice in a, in a phase plot. It looks almost like an attractor, uh, except that all the arrows are reversed. But in practice, it turns out that seeing a repelling fixed point in the activity you measure is essentially impossible because the activity that you measure will never go there. It will be repelled from this fixed point. And there are some very mean hybrids, yeah, like saddle points that are attractive in some directions and repelling in other directions. So I have a question here, Stefan. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Why why do we need unstable fixed points in the brain? Why do we need to be repelled away from a particular state? Well, for example, it would be useful if brain activity had a repelling fixed point at the origin. So the origin is the point in state space where none of the neurons is active. So it would actually be very unhealthy if uh, the origin would be attractive, because this would mean that just spontaneously the activity would go there and the brain would die. Yeah, so it's a good idea if the origin is a fixed point to make it repelling because it keeps things going and alive. Actually, what I wanted to say about uh, fixed points is that they are well defined in rate models, yeah, because this is a smooth concept. Yeah, you can make nice drawings, in particular if it's low dimensional. But in the moment that we are talking about spike trains rather than continuous signals, actually there is no such thing as flat activity, stationary activity, because spikes are by their nature transient activity. Yeah, so you're kicking the system each time a spike is being generated. And it's really only uh, for mathematical convenience that we talk about the spike density rather than the occurrence of individual spikes. So a fixed point in a spiking system makes actually not much sense uh, if you're talking about networks and collective activity. I wanted to throw this in because I think it's somehow. Yeah perspective and rate models quite generally and, and i don't know if you're following the chat i was just looking at the chat and i think brad already responded there was exactly that question if you have a neuron that shows persistent spiking at the fixed firing rate is that neuron at the steady state or not and of course the answer just like stefan said it depends if you're studying it from the point of view of the member potential it's not because it's constantly changing the member potential but if you're studying it at the level of the rate then yes it is exactly. so yeah spot on thanks <laughs> By the, way, the choice of rate models and spike dynamics, this also reflects where you come from in terms of neural coding. 
whether you are thinking that the brain encodes and processes information with firing rates, then you can just don't have to worry about uh, uh, spikes. Yeah. But if you believe or you have good reasons, good experimental evidence that spike time matters, then obviously you have to work with spikes. And clearly in the brain hardware, we know that there are properties. Synapses are sensitive to relative timings of the spikes. Neurons, what you studied yesterday, their FI curve changes if you drive them with correlated or uncorrelated spikes. So it turns out that at least the hardware level, neurons care for the synchrony or the spikes. And they bring in extra features. For instance, Stefan talked about noise, that there's nothing flat. So you get short noise almost for free in the brain because there are spikes. So everything could be flat, but your input currents will always be noisy. All these properties, I think they should have some computational consequences. Otherwise, brain will have to invent new circuitry to counter these. So I think this choice of model also will reflect which kind of neural coding philosophy you, you adhere to. Absolutely. Just to add a curiosity, it's always been something I find fascinating about the, when you see examples of plotted single cell firing, like not models, but plotted, you actually see the first burst normally have larger, uh, you know, it's the spike is bigger and everything, it kind of calms down. But generally no one ever considers that. I was delighted to hear about Juliana saying that like when they're babies, it's a very different looking spike because on EEG, the EEG of a baby looks very, very different from the EEG of an adult. And, you know, um, this is exactly uh, what you're saying. Is there like, it matters if you think it's important. Of course it's important, but it might not be important for the question you're asking. Yeah. Um, and like another thing about the right models, like the simplest ones, they can reproduce one kind of frequency type or like they can have some rhythmicity and they hit something. But more and more, you see that there are many frequencies um, happening at different time scales and different aspects that no, actually couple together um, attention. You know, there's more and more people showing that like attention is actually a delta kind of thing, which is very hard to see in a, a certain way. So, you know, it is very complicated. It varies the question. It varies what you want to look at. Uh, all of them are flawed, but almost all of them are useful. And it's just the question of, which floor are you willing to live with deep down? But I was delighted to hear about that baby thing. I hadn't realized that the baby, uh, oh, that's really fascinating stuff. Really brilliant. So this leads right into the next question, which is, which is similar, but let's keep building this intuition. I'm going to paraphrase Dean's question. He's saying, okay, so if we can say a single neuron is an oscillator that can be described with the equations we learned and a population of neurons can also be described with these rate models. And maybe we can then even apply it to the EEG. If we can keep going higher and higher in different scales and apply the same formulism, does this suggest something about the, the brain sort of processing information in a scale-free manner and how does that affect cognition and working memory, et cetera? And I would love to hear maybe from Conrad first on this one, if he's up to it. I, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I have a good, uh, I have a good answer for that. So I'll, I'll punt on that and, and uh, oh. uh, let the rest of the committee answer first. Great. Um, equations will always find a way of working. It doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> so that's a cheap answer. But you know, like the system of equations, you see, this is actually the other thing I want to say about right? um, different neurons fire in different fashions. And the integrating fire model is good, but it doesn't have that robustness. So that's why the Hodgkin Huxley everyone loves because it can do all the different types of firing. But maybe you don't care. And that's why rates models are nice because you maybe you don't care about the type of spiking. Uh, just the rate of the spiking. Um, but yeah, that's a really hard question. I'm going with Conrad and just punting it away and saying, uh -huh. yes. I, I can try to say, like, I can try to say just uh, two sentences about this. And that is, I mean, I think the fact that we can model all these different processes at these different levels with the same equations just goes to say, like, how powerful math is and how amazing it is that, you know, we can do computational neuroscience and actually use, you know, the very simple things that we learn in a, you know, first linear algebra in ODE's class in, in, 
in neuroscience and i think that's that's just amazing so i think it that, that's basically what it boils down to as john said all models are are you know in some way wrong you just have to be uh honest about what question you're trying to answer. And yeah, you can, what I'm, the amazing thing is you can use the same tools to answer all these different questions at these different levels. Conrad. Uh, actually, I thought <laughs> Anna will say something else that this is our uh, stupidity that we don't have better descriptions at every layer and we fall back to simple ODEs uh, uh, to describe this. Give so, us some time, we'll get there. Uh, yeah, I think my take is that we still haven't really uh, found a good description at the network level. Uh, if you look at biology, molecules are fairly well-defined, uh, synapses, neurons are bound by membranes, so we can define their transfer function and describe them mathematically correctly, or let's say to a good approximation. But from neuron onwards, we don't really know where are the boundaries of the system. How do we describe uh, uh, um, a network? What does actually matter? So we fall back to these uh, simplistic notions of average firing rates or oscillations or pairwise synchronization and things like that. So to me, it so, looks like that this is a reason why, why we seem to fit the same simple maths to it. Absolutely, Conrad. So, 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 so uh, let, let, let me project like my general angst about neuroscience here. And I'd love to have that <laughs> discussion a little with my fellow. Which hat are you wearing, Conrad? So, so, so when it comes to like simple dynamical systems, yes, we can fit it and we can fit it to all kinds of systems. And, and a cynic could say the reason why we do that is because we understand these systems well. No? Like the math is really well worked out. We have like all kinds of ideas in that space. But the fact that you can fit a model to some data doesn't make the model be right. Now, like I can fit a Taylor series expansion of something to like anything. And I might be just fine at that. So 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 at some level I'd like to 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 send that question right back to the panel. Like to which level do you think that the fact that we can that we can mm -hmm. fit those models, does it mean that these models have something to do with reality and I want to briefly link it to causality day there as well. Now, like at some level, if I say, uh, say this model is correct, at some level, I, I have a causal meaning about that. I, I, I like, I, I would basically want to say like, well, if the excited turnions had been a little more active, it would have gone to that other fixed point or something like that. So to which level, uh, to the, uh, to which level do you guys actually see the successes fitting? as indication that, uh, that that you're onto something. I mean, I think this is this is a hard thing to answer. I mean, it's it's like with any model. Uh, yeah, there's a comment on the chat, all models are lies, but yeah, some models are useful. I mean, it's like with any model, you try to fit a model, you try to capture some phenomena that are seen experimentally. And then, of course, you want to go beyond just validating your model and make predictions. And then, you know, in an ideal world, you convince your colleagues to do those experiments and then you refine the model further and the process continues. And so I don't know, I like to think like that in in this uh, in this naive and, and uh, yeah, positive, optimistic way that this is how how it works. I mean, I'm I don't know, I, I kind of disagree a little bit with Arvind. I don't think that we, I think it's really a scales problem. I don't think we fully understand how single neurons work. I mean, we maybe understand how single neurons work from the point of view of a leaky integrated fire neuron or Hodgkin-Huxley, but as we know, processes matter and there are people who study, you know, ion channels and like the molecular processes, you know, came kinase two and all sorts of, I mean, I'm in a department here with Erin Schumann who studies plasticity with all these molecules, like, literally thousands of thousands of molecules that I've never heard of that get up and down regulated in response to whatever uh, application of TTX that blocks the firing of the neuron. And, you know, I'm, you know, as a computational neuroscientist, I think, ah, synaptic scaling, you, you know, you apply TTX, you stop the firing of the neuron, and then, you know, mathematically, you can upscale your synaptic weight so that the neuron preserves its target firing rate. But then if you think about how this happens, this is not a, this is not a network of neurons, but it's still a network of molecules that somehow interact in very complicated ways that we just have no idea how this works. But I don't know, I mean, maybe we are limited by the techniques that we have and, and maybe, you know, there is hope in applying different kinds of techniques. Uh, 
but I still like to kind of hold this maybe somewhat naive view. Maybe Conrad will say it's a naive view that, yeah, we, you have to decide what kind of model you're going to build. You're going to build it. You're going to validate it and then try to make it better. And and so so that means that basically if if we could convince our experimentalist colleagues to do more, say, perturbation studies, we could quickly start feeling much more comfortable about the models we've been working on. No, like, like, what would be like a magical uh, well, experimental okay. device to, 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 to make us be more confident about our models? But there's two things there as well, kind of like, the objective maybe of a model in this area, as opposed to physics, is you build a model until it breaks as in there's an experiment design it doesn't do well for you know for example you have very sharp input the model reacts in the way you think it does very well but when you have maybe slowly ramping input the model doesn't recreate what's seen experimentally so therefore you have to readdress the model so you know and i said this in the other q a for the linear models a model breaking is a success a model not satisfying a criteria is massively important because you then know, okay, it's not as straightforward as that, but it means I have to think of something new in there. I have to add something. Sometimes you, uh, like sometimes mathematically, uh, I've done this where you just add a very awful thing that doesn't look beautiful, but it works for that moment. And then someone else who's better at maths will make it look more fluid and so forth. But that breaking in the model, that's not bad. Because we're not talking about laws of gravity, we're talking about something to describe a reaction, describe something. And these are statistical, like these are statistical probability, probability models. Like they're, they're statistical differential equations. It's not like they're deter truly deterministic. And the thing about you don't want a world where you stay in a steady state. You don't like you don't want your arm movement, for example. If you're describing an arm movement and you need your neurons to fire in a certain way. Yes, we try to reproduce an arm in, as best we can. But if I uh, pull a muscle because I'm over 40 and I'm old, I want to be able to move my arm and I want to be able to learn. But if I'm in a steady state where it's learned a perfect movement and that's all it can do, that's a terrible thing. So this thing about a steady state is a representation of it, but it doesn't mean it's the best form. There are variations of these steady states and very variations of these things. So I love and it's always my objective experimentally as well to see something works and then break it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the same, like when I play with models, I try to find inputs where the model just goes, Bleh. you know? Uh, and someone's asking, why use a sigmoid? Why not uh, the linear Dory LU? Well, because you can't have infinite firing, you know? Sometimes there is a model is restricted by its mathematics, but a model should also be restricted by its biology. And it's a very hard thing sometimes for a mathematician coming into an area to realize that something's restricted other than maths. You know, you can't have a thousand hertz firing range. You just can't. Absolutely. But you can mathematically. So which is right? Well, obviously, the biology, you know, because you're trying to reproduce a biological system. So, you know, it's that thing is, uh, it also gets a more general aspect of it. Uh, what's best. Great, okay, uh, yeah. Please. Oh, Garrett, not important. No, I was just, no, I'm sure it's important. I was just going to say, notice the time, and we need to go a little bit faster because there's so many great questions. But Stefan, please. OK, I think I, I, I thought I should add at this point that our models are actually not mathematical in nature, but physical. Yeah, so our models are based on some very fundamental principles borrowed from physics like this principle of equilibrium. So there are two forces, excitation and inhibition, and fixed point activity is where those two forces are in balance. I think this is something much more general, much more fundamental than any random differential equation you might come up with. I think the details of the differential equations, they do not really matter. As we know, I mean, there are often many models that roughly come up with the same predictions but it's these basic principles, like the one of equilibrium, or the principle that signals have to spread in a network along axons. Yeah, they cannot overcome uh, um, limitations by anatomy, for example. It's also a physical, a very simple principle, but I think it provides a lot of very interesting constraints, also in the activity dynamics that we either simulate or measure in experiments. 
Thanks, everyone. So right along to the next question, um, this is from Manolo. And I think a lot of people share this feeling that information processing or representational sort of the systems neuroscience approach uh, and dynamical systems perspectives are at odds or maybe even incompatible. Uh, what are your views on this? And I'll go briefly. And then if anyone else wants to go briefly, that would be great. I. I think there is that impression, but again, it's the issue of scale and measurement and what we have access to that we've already talked about. I, you know, in the epilepsy and sleep world, um, due to a number of reasons, you these are whole brain measurements, so you can't study all the single neurons, even if you wanted to in the first place. So these sort of abstracted models make more sense uh, in that way. There's a a lot of non-linearities in play, and you really need these formalisms to sort of make sense of your data. Nowadays, I work in the visual system, and largely there, we use single uh, tuning curves. Um, and again, that's because we have access to single cells. The visual cortex is right on top, so I can, I have access to single cell measurement in the first place. But I can also think about it as, um, you know, in, in the visual cortex or algae, and it's, you can kind of think of it as a feed-forward network and you have some sort of average firing rate, of course there's noise, but you have sort of a steady point and then you turn on the stimulus and after a transient period, you might sort of think of it as going into another stable fixed point. So it sort of depends on your question or in Ken Miller's outro, out we saw a really great example of, okay, there's this paradoxical effect. We have access to all of these neurons that we can measure in the visual system say, with calcium imaging now, but there's this paradoxical effect and we need a model because there's non-linear interactions. We need a formalism to help us sort of demystify it. But if anyone else has views on this, that would be great. I can say something. So, oh, yeah, Conrad was Conrad. before me. So oh, uh, after you, after you. So, I mean, it does look like that information processing approaches are somehow at odds with dynamical systems, right? But I think it's partly because that you assume when you think that uh, now I'm going to think of the brain as an information processing system, you already assume that my brain is already stable. It's not going to break down as I compute my probabilities or I create my tuning curves that I'm not going to get epilepsy. So first thing we should accept that uh, information processing layer of the brain, if we try to separate these, that it has to lie on the dynamical systems layer. They have to be compatible. Second thing is that there's this also perspective that, uh, uh, well, the dynamics itself is a computation, like as these trajectories, they move in the neural space. That, is a, uh, that itself is a correlate of uh, information processing. In a very simplistic form, this is like working memory as you go from background activity to a fixed point corresponding to the activity of some neurons, which represent something. But it could be uh, in more detail, like more recent work coming from, let's say, Alan Batista and Byron Yu, when they talk about all these low dimensional trajectories, which uh, account for your decision making or your movements. So I don't think they are so incompatible as they look like. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, to, to, to add to that, if you look at a bunch of like, meet uh, relatively new Krishna Shinoi papers. It's always, they're like always starting with like, there's the representational view versus the dynamical view. But seriously, that distinction is kind of, it, 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 it doesn't make, I, I don't really understand that distinction. No, like, and let me make the point for why kind of like, they must both be true. No, like there is no universe in which uh, that we currently hold as uh, as likely where each neuron is not dynamic and doesn't basically calculate its output based on the inputs from other neurons. No, like we don't have that neuron. Like the idea that the brain is not a dynamical system is entirely, it's, it's I can't understand why anyone would hold that view. Well, I think this is a perception from the fields. So certain subfields use dynamical systems approaches much more than other subfields. Uh, that's, that's, that's right. Each field focuses on something, but like the, 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 the fact that each of the two fields characterizes the other one as denying basic facts of neuroscience just doesn't feel quite fair, which is like, it's clearly a dynamical system, but it's also clearly representational. What, I'm, what do I mean with that? A neuron in the brain 
correlates to meaningful information about the outside world. Arguably, if I'm a neuron somewhere in the brain, I get inputs, they represent something. If they don't, then what I do can't be relevant. And like I produce an output, which kind of to other neurons in a way implicitly represents something. So, so kind of those two views can 100% both be right. And it's, Medina is absolutely right that there's these different fields. There's a field strongly represented here on the panel that, that views the brain as a dynamical system. And there's other views that strongly focus on how neurons relate to the outside world, like the movements we do and what we see. Um, they're both like perfectly valid scientific fields. If, if I may bring David Marr here, I think one would say that uh, information processing view lives somewhere in the middle layer, which is the algorithmic layer. And then we have the implementation layer where we have the dynamics of the brain. So all these algorithms that we are thinking of, they must comply with the dynamics. And just on the, like the systems have like EEG people. Um, and this is maybe about neuroscience. So a lot of EEG people don't read monkey stuff as much maybe that's maybe unfair to say but like you'll see more and more that like what we people see single cells are represented on the skeleton like there's the p3 is the big thing in there in eeg it's this thing that's meant to be decision making or whatever and you'll see it in areas of the rainbow and um, now people are saying that you can actually see those kind of responses early on even how the pupil responds to a stimulus can predict how you know so different areas of the brain are probably doing similar things, but maybe at different timescales and different accuracy levels. And like as someone who does a lot of multi-sensory work, I actually don't know what the hell the cortex is for. Uh, the superior calyctus seems to do everything. Um, and so I have just modeled the superior calyctus. But what I'm saying is that like, I, if I'm from a certain area, maybe I'll believe that my thing is the true answer. But as, a, as someone who does multi-sensory, but only does EEG, I ignore the superior collectus, but as I know, the superior collectus is the primary afferent for all this stuff. So I agree with that, but all the models for each of these areas can be slightly different. But the reason why I mentioned the superior collectus is there's a sequence of models um, done by Carl Frist in dynamic calls of modeling that looks at fMRI. Uh, and so um, they're very good, but they don't work so well for the superior collectus because the bold response is different, slightly different for different layers as well. So, you know, even within an area where they say, oh, this is our model, that model doesn't work perfectly for everything. So it's a, I agree that a lot of areas say, oh, I'll ignore that or I don't believe that, but that's just silly. Um, every area has really valid information. Um, and, and that's why I think computational neuroscience, that's why I kind of like it. Is, um, in, in the end, as you say, like these equations seem to go through all levels, which suggests there is a consistency. It's just people be willing to show these, you know? Absolutely. Okay, great. So we're, thank you, John. We're almost out of time. Um, I think there's a lot of questions. If everyone's okay, we can go like 10 minutes over and keep addressing. Great. So there's three or four questions that I'll average over now getting into the weeds a little bit about the activation function. We use the sigmoidal activation function today. Um, a lot of the students know that in deep neural nets, sometimes you use linearized functions or all sorts of other activation functions. Can we talk about why we use a sigmoid in today's, today's tutorial or in these sort of biologically based models and why, what the advantage of using more simplified activation functions might be? Maybe I can start. So um, I think we should not really use sigmoid models directly. Um, and the reason is um, that uh, a, a neuron model that we trust, which is the leaky integrate and fire neuron, uh, does actually not have a sigmoid transmission. It has a more complicated two-dimensional transmission function. So what I want to say is that we are really constraining our, our research uh, by the choice that we make at this point. So, Sometimes it's good to do so. Uh, for example, if you want to have rectification, then because you know in machine learning that it has a, a good effect, then maybe it's interesting to note that the perfect um, integrate and fire neuron, which is the neuron which has no leak, has exactly such a threshold linear 
rectify a transmission function. So in that case, it may be then a better choice uh, to use uh, as compared uh, to a sigmoid function. Um, if you, on the other hand, think that this rectifier does not really make an important contribution in the process that you're studying, for example, no major nonlinearities are observable in your experiments, then maybe linearizing the transmission in the first place might be a better option because it gives you many more possibilities for, for analysis uh, of, the, of the response of, of, of the system. Okay, so of course I was I was kidding, saying you should not use um, sigmoidal transmission functions. I, I only wanted to, to to really make the drastic point that this particular choice uh, has side effects, and one really should be aware of of this choice. So now somebody else can add to this. Yeah, like like I can I can give a, a deep learning perspective. We switched from. Uh, sigmoids to simple rectifying linear functions for two reasons. Uh, first, it works much better in most scenarios. The second scenario, uh, this, the second reason for that is if one actually looks at real world FI functions, they like look much more rec like rectified linear than their sigmoids. Why did people use sigmoids? Well, I guess the early models have been built by physicists or mathematicians who hadn't read the biological literature. <laughs> I'll just I'll just add one more thing. I mean, if you look at the outro today that Ken Miller presented, it wasn't a sigmoid and it wasn't a threshold uh, rectified neuron. It was actually a power law. And so, you know, uh, really, again, the, the, what you use probably depends on the area that you study. I mean, if you have the time on your hands to do the experiment and and actually characterize the tuning curve of the entire population, then go for it. That's really the right way so that you know how your population responds. As, as computational neuroscientists, we can try to infer that from the properties of the single neurons to get at this coarse grained tuning curve of the population, which is not always the same thing. And sometimes we get that right, sometimes we don't get it right. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, what kind of a function you use depends on on the question. And maybe maybe Conrad is right. Maybe we used to use sigmoids because this was kind of the physics approach. The Wilson Cohen model from 1974 used sigmoids. But as we saw from Ken Miller's uh, lecture, you can use power laws, and they, there's a lot of evidence now that at least cortical computations use these power laws. And the really cool thing about the power laws is that. A, you can still do everything that we did today in the sense that you can find fixed points, you can linearize, right? You can linearize and, and you can, you know, find the stability locally around the fixed points and so on. And then the other cool thing about using the power law, as Ken showed today, is that, you know, this, these kinds of tuning curves have so many cool computational properties and implications for what these networks of ENI populations can do, surround suppression, balanced amplification, and so on and so forth. But yeah, ultimately use what what uh, seems appropriate for the system you're studying. Um, just on that, like it, it's great. It, it, sigmoid causes hassle uh, yeah. mathematically. It's much easier to use. <laughs> but there's a thing that maybe, and I'm just going to speak personally. The reason why I like an equation, it's such a personal thing. So. You did integrating fire. I actually really love the Zvikovic model. I don't know why. It's that thing is sometimes. And what's that? What was that model? The Zvikovic model. Uh, it's mentioned familiar, somewhere yeah. in the in supplementary materials. It's just a single cell. Okay. Um, and, and the reason why I like it is I can't say. It's like, why do you like a color? Sometimes it seems weird to say because we're meant to be very cold and calculating, but like why I like a model sometimes it's just I like a model. Uh, and <laughs> That's why you start into a model sometimes. Uh, but John, why someone goes a sigmoid is they came from an area where they like yeah. sigmoids. Why uh, these linearizations? Because now machine learning is shown actually it works better, it's quicker to do stuff, and maybe it's worthwhile looking at. You know, there is a very even more so, uh, and it's something that kind of annoys me when I write my uh, method section is that I take out the we and I because it's meant to be all cold and calculating. But I choose my statistical method, I choose my model. You know, someone else can choose an equally valid model that's equally useful, but it's my choice. And so yeah. that's the same thing as linear as a, making it linear is much easier though. I'm a big fan for that. 
Yeah, John, can you can you comment on tractability a little bit? You said sig points cost hassle. What does that mean? Well, because you have this nonlinear component, you have to divide it by. So when you take it in, you're adding a nonlinear underneath. So if you suddenly make it a line that just scales up easily, then you, like, if you remember from a week ago, there were linear functions where you can perfectly get the answer for everything, that they have a nice steady state. You know if it has a complex eigenvalue or eigenvector. You don't have that with nonlinear equation. You can linearize. And you can do computational simulations to find the steady state and all these things, right. but it's a bit more trouble. Yes. So if you have lots of neurons and a big network and you want to run them fast and efficiently, you can. Oh yeah, no, that, but you can get the analytic can... solution. Yes. You could even have an analytic solution if the input isn't complicated. You can even go as far as that. It, but like specifically for these rate models, that F makes it nonlinear. The F makes it hard. Absolutely. If you get rid of that F and just say, let's make a line. Oof, life's easy Great. and that's Another. not a bad thing but it might not be what works every time and, yeah. and, and, and like to go back to a week ago once again with the linear models uh, and uh, when you think about two things competing mm -hmm. um, if you subtract away the competing or the interaction of them it becomes very easy but that doesn't mean it represents what's happening and so that's the trade-off but yeah the sigmoid I think it's loads of Psychophysicists and uh, people who do single cells see a sigmoid function everywhere they look, and maybe that's also a reason. You know, yeah. uh, all the early stuff it looks like a sigmoid, but is that a viable function? Is that cumulative Gaussian? Is it a logistic? Oof, you know, that's that's a whole other conversation, and that's personal preference as well. Perfect, thank you. Uh, okay, I think let's end on this question. Unless after I ask, we go through this one. Any of the panelists wants to answer? Uh, one more, and then we'll close out. Uh, so let's get back into application and biology. Luciano is asking, in a neural population, maybe it has a well-defined meaning rate, but in a real brain, let's say you're at a stable point, what causes transitions into and out of that point? What sources of brain activity could, could cause you to fluctuate between different stable points and, and produce oscillations? Well, inputs, that would be the first thing that will drive you from one fixed point to another. Um, intrinsic state of the brain. Depending on which operating point you are, you are associated with certain level of noise, certain uh, oscillation, for instance, and they can drive you to different uh, uh, fixed points. So I suppose even neuromodulators and other chemistry that happens in the brain, that can drive you, give you new fixed points altogether. Yeah, this gets into the issue of noise. So external inputs, which could be sensory, of course, uh, and also anything intrinsic or internal to the network, which could be uh, yeah, neuromodulation or disinhibition or some very targeted input to a particular neuron or brain area. But it could be just fluctuations due to yeah, whatever ongoing activity in the animal, whatever that means, whether it's noise, variability, everybody maybe interprets that differently. Other thing maybe is that since you are such a high dimensional system, it's I think almost impossible that all fixed points are stable fixed points. At least they will have some directions which will be unstable. Mm -hmm. And then even small noise fluctuations can throw you out. So essentially the brain is made up of then saddles, which have at least one unstable uh, dynamics. And uh, as uh, Professor Suda used to say, my mentor used to quote him a lot. So I quote him now to you that uh, brain perhaps is just always in transition from one fixed point to another fixed point. It's never anywhere. So. Stefan? Yeah, that was approximately the same thing I wanted to say. So there are these mean fixed points, the settled ones, which are responsible for transient activity. So there is no need to actively force, enforce a transition by external input. It just happens by intrinsic dynamics. So that's at least a possibility we should also take into consideration when looking at, at real brain data. So there is no need that it's um, perturbation from outside that makes the transition. And a great follow-up. Oh, I'm sorry, John, go ahead. I was just going to say, do, uh, Stefan kind of said it as well, uh, but like input doesn't have to be external. Input is just input to the area. So like, you know, the state, and once again, uh, 
I do think the reason why the brain has to keep moving because it's easier to move in a different direction than start moving. It's easier to do a course change than start a full car and, and so forth. So like I, I think the brain is always, that background activity is important because if you're moving, then it's easier to make it separate movement. But if you're static and you're a stable position, it's very hard, you know, to not, if you've decided to vote for someone, it's very hard to decide to vote for someone else. I'm not saying who that someone was, but people shouldn't vote for him. But please vote. Yeah. Just go vote. <laughs> yes, just go vote. But I'm not in America. I have nothing to do with that. Okay, but I mean, a, other yeah. countries are acceptable. <laughs> there's a good follow-up to this question in the chat. Xiao Xiong is asking, but what is it about certain brain circuits or brain regions that have very stable oscillations between two fixed points? What's different between stable oscillations and sort of more, more loose and... Um, is there something about the connectivity in those regions? I think some of these brain areas that could be mentioned here are the basal ganglia. And I think if the basal ganglia start to oscillate, then this is often referring to a pathological state, a state which is sort of locking the dynamic possibilities uh, that exist. So uh, I think in, in general, it's actually not really desirable to have uh, lots of oscillations around because they limit the dynamic possibilities uh, of, of the network. But there are also like the motor system has lots of non pathological oscillations. Yes, central all... pattern generators, right? Yeah. This yeah. is the yeah. pattern generator. But that also needs input from other areas. Like on the scalp EEG, alpha was the big one. Um, you know, it's the first thing shown that the brain goes at 10 hertz second and all that. But yes. that's generally idling. It, it's actually the inverse. The larger that is, the less attentive you are. Like probably people right now after an hour and 10 minutes supposed to talking about dynamical systems. But you know, that's it resting, but it doesn't mean that it can't be kicked out of its orbit. You know, there's a difference between something oscillating and then something static, truly static, static point, you know? So it is funny, like on oscillation, it's nice because it's easy to knock something out of its orbit when it's in that, so people can attend. So what it. is common among all of these circuits with stable oscillations that we just mentioned. So I can take that. And what is common is an EI loop. And I give you a very concrete example. Uh, Stefan mentioned about diseases. I think diseases is the perhaps the only place where you, you know, find always stable oscillations. Of course, there are behavioral conditions where you find stable oscillations, like theta oscillation appear when the animal is running. But there, there are all kinds of inputs going in into the brain. So in Parkinson's disease, there is this basal ganglia region, and there there is a nice EI circuit, and you change the parameters of that because of dopamine or whatever else happens there, that system gets into oscillation. It oscillates at uh, beta frequency, something like 20 or so. Take a completely different system. This is thalamocortical loop, exactly the same kind of uh, structure, EI connections. And here also, exactly the same thing happens, uh, that uh, some connectivity uh, changes, and now system oscillates, but at a slightly different frequency. I think there it is in the range of 10 hertz or so. And they happen to be, one is in the sensory periphery, so thalamocortical one is sensory periphery, and people who have this, they complain of absence epilepsy. Um, motor periphery is the basal ganglia, and there when these oscillations appear, then you have problem in moving. So the common thing in all these various loops is EI. Uh, sometimes it involves two E steps or two I steps. That, that is a detail, but this is the easiest way to get EI os uh, oscillations of any sort. And brain is full of EI loops everywhere you look. Perfect, thanks. Um, okay, so we are super over time, and I'm sorry to the students. There are so many great questions. We didn't get to them all. There was some peer pressure in the chat, but please, uh, we have a Neurostars forum. Take those questions there. Uh, some of the panelists and other people, your TAs, will will all try to answer them there. Um, and if we could just have, you know, 30 second closing comments from the panelists, starting with Juliana. Uh, about today's content application, um, any advice for the students, and then we'll sign off. 
Yeah, so what came obvious today from the discussion and from the question is sort of how do you pick the right kind of models? How do you know uh, that you're looking at the right system, that, that you have a good model to describe the system that you study and, and what is the right scale at which you do this? And I guess um, my answer to that or my suggestion to that would be think very hard about the the biological system, the, the neural circuit that you're trying to model and to represent and to describe and, and pick your model uh, to have the capability to uh, to address the, the type of questions that you want to address. So pick the right kind of spatial scale. Are you going to look at a detailed biophysical model with multiple ion channels and the genetic processes? Are you going to look at interacting populations of neurons or even brain regions? Um, or, you know, what is the temporal dynamics? Are you going to look at individual spike times? Or are you going to look at uh, rate models? And after you decide that, then, you know, look at your model, study it mathematically using some of the techniques you learned about today or read about new techniques. And then, yeah, try to, to make, uh, to validate it using existing data and, and then uh, try to make it useful uh, for the future kinds of uh, experiments that you might want to do. Thank you. Stefan? Well, I would just advise do not take anything for granted uh, in your work. Yeah? You should challenge any model that your advisor puts on your table. Just take it apart, ask lots of questions, and only if you're really convinced that it's the right level getting you in the right direction, then you should go for it. Otherwise, be skeptical. All right. Perfect, thank you. That's good advice for everyone, not just students. John? <laughs> and experimentally as well, um, you know. Um, I would say, actually, what I, if you are an experimentalist, maybe it's easy to think about the models as an excitation inhibition. Think of it like that, think of it like a balance. Um, the mathematics do matter, but the understanding and intuition maybe is a better way to approach these things. If it makes sense to you on an intuitive level, then the maths will come after. That's why I say for all these things, if you intuitively understand an oscillation or you understand how two things battle each other to make a decision, then the rest of the stuff will come into place uh, with me. And as I said, like the, the model you use should be the best model for your question, not the best model. You know, not the one that describes everything, but the best for your question. Uh, and then see if you can break it. Always see if you can break it. That's the best thing. That's good advice. Arvind? So these two days, uh, the kind of models we looked at, they fall in the mechanistic category. So don't just put parameters in your model because I think uh, um, it's your obligation to explain the role of each parameter that you have put in your model. I see a lot of examples where people are studying network dynamics and then they boast about it that, hey, I have put Hodgkin Huxley neuron with 200 dendrites. And when you look into that, you find that these dendrites are just doing nothing. Right? So add complexity on the needs. Build it like that. that I mean, we can't do this for the brain. If we could, we would. But at least in models, we can. So build it up. I think synthesis should be the goal of modeling. Add uh, details only when necessary. Uh, yeah, uh, apparently I get to say a last statement as well. I, I just wanted to emphasize that in a way, this is the most beautiful part of theoretical neuroscience that you've seen so far. And like, it's kind of like as far as we can push systems that are complicated where we can still produce meaningful, theoretically beautiful insight. And that's, uh, and that's why I, I, I was so excited about like these two days. And I think that's why you should be so excited about it these days. This is kind of like the frontier at the moment of the kinds of models that we can still analytically really grasp and that we can understand as humans. And that's just fantastic. Hey. Thank you so much to all the panelists and to the audience. Overflow of questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to them all. And I hope you guys all enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.